When we look at the words of scripture, they're the words that were written or recited by human beings, by prophets and apostles. But they're also the exact words that God wanted recited or written. In fact, if you look in the book of Hebrews, it will cite the same passage from Psalm 95. And one time it'll say, well, David said this. And then another time it'll say, the Holy Spirit said this, right? Both true, dual authorship, concurrent authorship. And as the words of God, God is a truth teller. He, it's impossible for him to lie. He's one who tells complete truth. So in everything that the, the scriptures seek to affirm, they're completely truthful. At the same time we, we acknowledge this, we acknowledge that if you were to put side by side, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, uh, you'd find these surface level incongruities that to the, to the superficial reader say, well, what, what's going on here? Is this two people here? Was there one person here? Did this happen this way? Did this happen this way? And, and I would argue that these are the same kind of surface level incongruities that we would expect in any historical retelling of an incident by different eyewitnesses. Every kind of eyewitness account is going to have summarizing, partial reporting, it's going to have paraphrasing, it's going to have rearranging of the material chronologically, and that's exactly what we find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In the first generation after the New Testament, um, there was a gentleman named Papias. And Papias, uh, one of the things that he, he said, he tells us that uh, the Gospel of Mark was Mark writing down what Peter preached. And so the Gospel of Mark, Mark was not a follower of Jesus during his earthly ministry, but he followed Peter. And ac Papias tells us he accurately wrote down everything that Peter said, but not in chronological order. This is significant. The earliest generation after the Gospels recognized the Gospels are not intended to be presented in chronological order. So if we as modern readers just assume, well, these are in chronological order, and then we find things in different order, oh, this is a mistake, what's going on? This, we're, we're asking something that the inspired authors never intended to give us. So for example, maybe you, you look at the the temptation narrative in Luke 4 versus the temptation narrative in Matthew 4. Same three temptations offered, but in Matthew 4, the last temptation is on a high mountain. Luke, the final temptation, is on the pinnacle of the temple. If we could fly back through a time machine and have raw video footage, which one was it? I don't know. But I know in choosing those two different presentations, there's probably an emphasis that Luke is trying to make and that Matthew's trying to make. In Matthew's gospel, it's striking how many times mountains are a motif, right? Jesus is the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. The gospel ends with Jesus being on a high mountain and saying, go make disciples of all nations. And so possibly tracking with that motif, we have this final temptation on the mountain, Matthew, Matthew lining that up with this mountain motif he uses. Or if you read Luke and Acts, it's possibly fitting in with some emphasis that Luke has on what is the relevance of the temple in light of the new covenant fulfillment that's taken place in Jesus, that he makes the, the temple temptation the, the final one. Again, the point is, neither gospel is claiming, claiming chronological specificity for the reporting, and so we as modern readers shouldn't ask and demand something of the text that the inspired author is not intending to give. An example I, I've given to my students in the past is, uh, is a historical example for my own life. A while back, my wife's minivan uh, gave out in the Walgreens parking lot, so the, the battery died. So I got a call, I drove over my Corolla and gave the keys to my wife, and she took uh, the three kids and her. They, they went home and I stayed with the minivan while the battery repair guy came and changed the battery. Now, in talking about that the next day, I could say, I could write an email and say, uh, my wife's minivan broke in the parking lot. Or in talking to someone, I could just say, yeah, my car, I'm sorry, I couldn't make the meeting, my car broke down yesterday. Or to someone else, you, you say, why was your wife driving, you know, your car, oh, her car broke down. So someone looking at this hundreds of years later could say, well, this, you know, clearly someone is being deceptive. Does his wife have a minivan or does his wife have a car? Or is it his car? Because one time he said it was his car, one time it said it was her car, another time he said it was her minivan. Now we realize in colloquial English usage, 
a car can describe any vehicle that a family would drive. It, it, broadly referring to a minivan, an SUV, a sedan, or whatever. We also recognize that in terms of, our fa in terms of the, the marriage, the family that I have, what's mine is hers, what's hers is mine. In fact, my name is on the title of the minivan. So technically it is my minivan, but she drives it all the time. So is it her minivan or is it my minivan? So these are the kinds of things where, where when you actually look into the, the details of it, it makes good sense and there's no deception. It's just a partial reporting or there's a different emphasis in the way that something is being retold. And really we find the very same thing in the Gospels. For example, the genealogy of Matthew versus the genealogy in Luke. So if you look in Matthew 1 and you look at Luke 3, you can sort of line the names up, especially beginning with Joseph and going back the, the generations right after that. You can write them down and you'll see there are differences. Why is this? Well, this is something that was discussed by many Christians in the earliest years. And Eusebius, a famous church historian who wrote in the early 300s, he talks about various different views, and then he, he seems to favor the views of a, of a gentleman named Julius Africanus. Julius Africanus was born in 160 AD, roughly, and Julius Africanus cites testimony even earlier of people who've gone to the land of Israel, the Holy Land, and have had conversations, had actual interviews with the physical descendants of Jesus' half-brothers and sisters. So these are, you know, the Gospels speak of Jesus' half-brothers and sisters, and people actually talk to their children and their grandchildren. And according to Julius Africanus, the reason for this discrepancy is because in the lineage of Joseph, there was a Leverite marriage. And if you read the Old Testament, it seems somewhat of a strange regulation to us, but if, if a brother died, the other brother would, would marry the widow, but the offspring would be considered the offspring of his brother. So there's a legal lineage, and then there's a biological lineage. And Julius Africanus tells us that the reason for the discrepancy in these genealogies is that one of them follows the legal lineage, and one of them follows the biological lineage. So we notice in this discussion, number one, it's the kind of thing that we would expect from the complexity of life. Life is complex in modern and ancient times, and we're not surprised that, that on the surface level we have these discrepancies which further study clarifies. Secondly, we, do, we don't find ancient Christians just saying, oh, well, you know, don't ask about it. <laughs> Who knows? You know, but there's an actual, well, here are three possibilities, and each of the possibilities submits itself to the reliability and authority of Scripture. And so we, we need to follow that example, I think, when we're looking at these discrepancies. What I would encourage a modern reader to do who has questions is just to be honest and real about it and say, hey, these are the things that I'm trying to figure out. Pray about it. Study the text carefully. Ask questions of a trusted source. You know, we, the faculty here at Southern Seminary, we're eager to be a resource to people. If people, sometimes I get random emails and questions from people about stuff and I can direct them places. But uh, I would just say, don't be afraid to ask honest questions and to seek help in answering those if you need it. And remember that God is a loving Heavenly Father who's not trying to trick you or hide things from you, but who hears when you call to Him and has given us a reliable and trustworthy word, a reliable and trustworthy account of how He's revealed Himself in history preeminently in the sending of His Son to live a perfect life and to die for us.